church is, but you truly want to follow God in everything, in every area of your life. But in order to do that, it takes you and I making some sacrifices. It takes you and I being obedient. Everybody say amen. Uh, we have to be obedient to the word of God, not obedient to the what we've justified in our mind. Amen. A lot of times we're real good about convincing ourselves that this is the best thing to do, but every decision needs to be backed up with prayer and it needs to be based on the Word of God, amen? So if you were here Sunday morning, you, we're going to kind of follow up and I'm just going to piggyback off of that, that message and I've got a few more scriptures. In, in Matthew chapter 7, we find here where Jesus is teaching and it's known uh, in the scripture as the Sermon on the Mount. It's the... Uh, there's, there's where the Beatitudes begin, and he's teaching on this, and he covers all kinds of different, uh, different things in life that Jesus is really, uh, he's not taking away from the Old Testament, he's adding to it. Uh, he's, he's enhancing the law and really putting a new perspective on it. He's not doing away with the Ten Commandments and away with the Old Testament, but he's bringing in a new, uh, he's really just making it a little more difficult. For example, if you flip back over into, into chapter 5, it, in the Old Testament, I'll we'll just say, Thou shalt not commit adultery. All right? And Jesus takes that commandment and says, You shouldn't just commit adultery, but you should not even look at a woman. And if you think it in your mind, then you have committed adultery. Now, how many know those are two different things? How many know those? That's a little more intensely, Roy, than, than in, <laughs> you know, have you ever committed adultery? No. Have you ever looked... Okay, now that's a different question. That's, you, you, it's, those are two different things. And so Jesus here begins to expand on that and really take it a little step further. And he deals with adultery and he deals with divorce and he deals with loving your enemies and murder. And listen, and, and it, it's more than just thou shalt not murder, but you should not even have anger in your heart. You should not be angry enough to lead to that. And so Jesus just begins to teach on basically giving us the blueprint of what it is to be a Christian, what it is to truly follow Christ the way the Word says it, not the way we've, we've set it up in our mind. We talked about that Sunday morning about if you can have a belief, but if your belief is not based on reality, reality then it's just a delusion. It's not, you're delusional. You're, you're trying to convince yourself of something that is never, ever, ever going to happen and so many times in our walk with God, we do that. We think that we're really going to get to heaven and we're really going to do this based on something that has nothing to do with Scripture. Amen? So it's very important that we follow God's Word. And so we find here in chapter 7, we read Sunday morning and, and the command and really the teaching that he gives, and it's a promise. In, in verse 13 and 14, he he tells us, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many, and many enter through it. Verse 14 says, but small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only few find it. You see here, he makes the distinction. Jesus says, listen, many will be on the broad road. Many are going to be on the road that seems comfortable, and it's easy, and doesn't require any discipline. But few will be on the narrow road that leads to life. There will be few people that will truly follow that road. And in order to do that, you and I, there has to be an attitude of holiness. There has to be a desire to see the things of God. The things of God, the blessings of God have to be greater than the desires of Justin Harris. Amen? It has to be greater. I've got to want the things of God more than I want the things of the flesh. Because if there's one thing that you and I are good at, that's taking care of ourselves. That's why when Jesus, when they, they confronted Jesus and said, which is the greatest of the commandments? And he said, listen, love the Lord your God with all your mind, your heart, and soul. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Why did he say that? Because we know we love me some me. You're going to take care of yourself at the end of the day. You're going to make sure you're not the one that gets hurt and you're the one that gets fed. You're the one... Jesus was saying, listen, you will love yourself. You need to love other people in that same manner. You need to invest in them like you would want someone to invest in you. Amen? And so Jesus is teaching here, and he gives us instruction. Listen, broad is the road. Narrow is the, broad is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the road that leads to life. And many are going to find themselves on this road. And then he goes on to say, 
verse 21, and this is where it really gets a little intense. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, Jesus speaking, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And we address this Sunday morning and I ask you these three questions. I'm going to ask them again tonight. Number one, does your life reflect what you say you believe? Does your life reflect what you say you believe. It's one thing to preach the gospel. It's one thing to preach being a Christian. It's one thing to be able to quote the Bible and be able to tell all the theology and be able to explain it. But does what you believe, does your life reflect what you truly say you believe? We've all been in that category where we maybe probably could be called a hypocrite. Amen? Maybe we were saying things but probably wasn't living it the way we should. But we did a real good job of preaching it and presenting it to someone else. And you don't have to shake your heads. I know you've done it because it's, it's inside of us. It's that desire to make sure we let people know how they should be living while we overlook some of the obstacles and the sins and the things in our own life. Scripture talks about don't worry about the speck in someone else's eye when you've got a plank in your own eye. Amen? It's talking about, listen, you worry about your relationship with God, and I promise you that will keep you busy. Amen? If you can worry about you, we'll all worry about each other, and that way we'll be in good shape. Amen? If you worry about yourself, I promise you God's conviction will keep you busy. So Jesus here makes this teaching and, and gives this to him along with all this. other. Listen, there's going to be many people who will think they will enter into heaven only because of what they've said and what they've done in their knowledge. Second question is this, do you think you're on the right road because of what you've done? And we addressed this Sunday morning that the first thing that happened that, he, that Jesus addressed, there'll be many of them who say, Lord, what do you mean you don't know me? Didn't I drive out demons? Didn't I perform miracles? I prophesied. I did all this stuff in your name. How, how can I not go to heaven? And we will first, we have to battle that just because we're doing things for God and we're involved in what God is doing. We can't confuse that with a relationship with God. We know that Scripture says that faith without works is dead. There has to be action to our faith. There has to be something that's lived out in order for us to, to be in covenant with God and to make sure that we're right. And I've had, listen, after Sunday morning, I had texts and emails and phone calls Pastor, I, I want to make sure I'm going to heaven. I don't, I don't, I'm confused. I'm worried. If, am I not going to get to heaven? I know, how do I know for sure? You don't know for sure. You better hit your knees. You better ask God to help you. Now listen, you, we've got to understand here in this context, this is, it, it doesn't mean there has to be that relationship that you are obeying God and you're praying, but you can't confuse being busy in the kingdom of God with being in God's will. Okay? You can be busy in church, and you can be volunteering for everything, and you can be involved, but that doesn't mean that you're in God's will. But, and the only way you're going to know that is if you spend time with God in prayer and in devotion and reading God's word, and you hear from God. And you have to know his voice, and you have to, to know exactly what God is saying to you and not rely on somebody else. Because what Jesus is addressing here is people saying, well, listen, I have to, it has to be of God because, because people are getting saved. Do, do you realize this morning, or this morning, tonight, I'm sorry, I'm on Sunday morning. I, I shared this with, with your son, Larry, Sunday after church. Because we had this conversation and he said, I just don't understand how's, how can God use you if you're not living right? I can have, I have the knowledge right now. I have the knowledge to lead someone to Christ. I could backslide and I could from this moment forward for the next 10 years of my life not live for God and not serve God and not preach and turn my back on God. But I would still have the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And if somebody wanted to be saved, I could tell them and show them 
how they could accept Christ. And guess what? They could accept Christ and they could receive salvation in spite of my sin and in spite of my ignorance. God could still use me even though I'm not obedient to him. Does that make sense? The truth is what sets people free. It's the truth of the gospel. It's the power of the gospel. It's the power of the message that has the ability to change someone's life and to break every yoke and every addiction. It's the, it's the, it's the good news that has the power to do that, not me. And that's what Jesus was focusing on here was that it's my word and it's my message and it's my love that saves people. It's not your talent. It's not your ability to prepare a message and to present something that is entertaining. That's not what saves people. It's not numbers. It doesn't matter that you have thousands that show up to hear you speak. That's not where it's at. Everybody with me tonight? It's in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Studying today, if you look right there, if you stay in Matthew chapter 7 and you just you go down to the next passage Jesus addresses one last thing here as he finishes this up. And this, this is basically for me, I, I'm not a very complicated person. I'm not a very complicated man. I, things are real simple for me, and I like to keep them that way, all right? Or if you know what I'm talking about, it's just real simple. I, just, <laughs> I, need it, I, need it, I don't need all the bells and whistles. I just need, just give me the bare bones. I, I'm okay with that. And Jesus breaks this down here. This way, I love the way Jesus, he taught in parables, just in stories, things you can remember, things that just really apply. And this is where you know, and this is where you kind of secure, am I on the right path? Am I going to be accepted into heaven? Am I doing God's will? How do I know for sure? Here's, here's where it works right here. It gets back to the very basic principle of the gospel, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice... Catch that. It's more than just hearing God's word. It's more than just being in church. Listen, I'm all for you being in church. And I believe any time you can be where the word of God is being taught, it's being preached, it's being sung, you're reading it, God's word says it'll never return void. And so it has the ability every time God's word and his truth and his promises are are read and you hear it, it has the ability to impact your life. It can bring conviction. It can bring correction. It can bring peace and comfort. All of that. How many believe that tonight? It is still alive. It's still active. And it brings life. It is God breathed. God said there's both power, both life and death in the tongue. And the word is true. It's the written inspired word of God. It was spoken. It's God breathed. It has life in it. It's not dead. It has the ability tonight Across this room, we have everybody in different age groups, different, just different, different spectrums of life, different stages of life. We have grandparents, and we have teenagers, and we have we got people with kids, people without kids. We have people that are married and not married, and you're, it's all, but it has the ability when you read God's Word to hit every single person in a different way. I can't do that. There's no way I can prepare a message thinking, Okay, I hope Dee's here tonight, and I hope the Willets are here tonight, and I'm so glad Shannon's here tonight because I prepared it just for Shannon Denson, so that's good. I can preach that. I, there's no way I can do that. There's no way I, can, I can't do that. I have to prepare and preach God's Word, and God's Word is able to meet every need. But here's, here's what Jesus says. Here's the, way, here's the way he follows that up when he says, Listen, many, 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 many are going to say, Lord, Lord, Did I not prophesy? Many are going to do that. And he says, few are going to enter in. He follows it up with this. Anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now, we're getting real simple here. We're getting back to children's church, all right? We're getting back to building your house on the rock or on the sand, all right? This is getting very elementary, but it's it's just that simple. It's like a man who built, a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, and it beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. 
But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. You see, it doesn't matter what you build. It doesn't matter how incredible it is. I don't care if it's three stories. I don't care how many years you've served. If the foundation is not right, it doesn't mean anything. The foundation has to be right. Your relationship with God is the most important thing. Your belief, your faith has to be based on the truth. It doesn't matter. Jesus, very simple. If you obey my commands and you hear my words and you hear my teachings, and if you will do what it says, you will be like a man who builds his house on the rock. And it doesn't matter what comes away. doesn't matter what attacks your family. doesn't matter financial troubles that you have. It doesn't matter what life blows your way. It cannot be shaken because it's built on something that is bigger and stronger than what the world can throw at you. But if you don't obey His commands, you can still build something and you can still build your house and it will be pretty and it will be impressive. But when troubles come, And when you face temptation and the enemy throws everything he can at you, you will fall. Your faith will crumble because your faith is not in God. Your faith is not in a relationship with him. Your faith has been put in your job. It's been put in money. It's been put in your contacts and your resources. It's been put in relationships. And if you build it on that, it will fall. Chapter 8, and I'm going to close with this. This is one of my favorite stories, examples, miracles in all of the Bible. And I, I have prayed more times than I can count that God would give me this kind of faith right here. Chapter 8, if you have your Bibles, y'all need to be marking this down. If you don't have your Bible with you, you need to be writing this down so you can go home and read it and mark it in your Bible. Because this isn't just one of the, this is just my opinion of one of the greatest examples of faith. This is Jesus who actually says, "This is one of the most faithful men, or one of the, I've never met a man that has this much faith." We see here in verse five, chapter eight, when Jesus had entered into Capernaum, a centurion man came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, "My servant lies at home, paralyzed and in terrible suffering. He has come on behalf." Of his servant. Okay? Not his wife, not his child, not his dad or his mom, his servant. He has come on behalf of his servant. This is not, his servant is sick. He has heard that Jesus has the ability to heal. Not just, he's not coming for his best friend, he's coming for his servant, my servant. Lies at home paralyzed, and he's in pain. He's suffering. Jesus said to him, okay, I'll go and heal him. Now, this is where the story for you and I, this is where this man differs from every single person in this room. And I, Well, I probably shouldn't say that because you might have this kind of faith. But I know for me, <laughs> had I went to Jesus and said, hey, my servant is paralyzed in need. Can you come? And Jesus said, sure, man. I'm on my way. Let's go. I'd have been like, let's go, man. I've heard about you. I've seen this happen. I can't believe you're going to come with me. This is great. This is perfect. This is exactly why I came because I knew you would care. I knew all that. This would all, this would be perfect for me. I love meeting people that are popular. And I, I would love that. That would be incredible. A few years ago, I took Riley to a golf tournament to the Byron Nelson in, in Dallas. And he had heard on TV that, that Tony Romo was going to play in this tournament. And so 
as it led up to it, something happened and he couldn't play in it. And Riley at this time, this has been, oh man, this has been three, maybe four years ago. So Riley was eight, around eight or nine years old. So we go to this golf tournament, there's people everywhere. And I told Riley the whole way up there, Riley, Tony Romo's not playing in the tournament. We were not going to see Tony Romo because he kept saying, I'm going to see Tony Romo and I'm going to get his autograph. He just keeps, blah, blah, blah. and I'm trying to, you know, as a dad, trying to break it to him. Listen, son, he's not playing in the tournament. We're not going to get to see him. You know, we'll see all these other cool people and all this stuff. So we, we go, and we're there all day. We walk around the whole golf course. We're seeing all these people. And so finally, towards the end of the day, we go to the, the 18th hole, and there's a place where you can stand, and all the, the, the pros will come after that. When they get done, they sign on their way to sign their scorecard. They'll walk, and they'll, they'll sign gloves and balls and we had this deal that you could sign and a hat and all this stuff. So we're getting all these autographs and different things. And I'm standing here, and Riley's right here, and there's a barrier right here. And there's a, there's a 16-year-old kid out of Dallas that is leading the tournament. It's like the third round. He's 16 years old, and he's beating all these pros. And so everybody is following this kid. And he is about to, he's about to tee off on the 18th green. There's all these people. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye, I noticed this guy get up, drive up on a golf cart on the back of it, and he's in baggy shorts and shirt, and he's got a hat on, glasses, everything. I don't even, I mean, I see him, but I don't pay much attention to him. And I'm standing there, and we're looking down on the green, and someone, and I'm standing here. There's a barrier right here. And I look over, and Tony Romo is standing right there, right next to me. I mean, I'm just like, you got to be kidding me. That's, he's standing right here. He's in big glasses, ball cap, I mean, flip-flops and shorts. I mean, he just looks like any regular dude. And so Riley's standing right here. Nobody has seen him yet. Nobody even recognizes him. They don't even know he's, I mean, they're all focused down here on the green. And so I tap Riley on the shoulder, and I said, hey, it's Tony. And Riley's like, he just freezes. And so Riley has his hat, and we have a mark and everything. And I said, hey, Romo, will you sign his hat? And he was like, oh, yeah, man, I'd love to. Turns around, and I said, Riley, tell him thank you. And he goes, tell, tell him you Frozen. He hasn't shut up all day about seeing Tony Romo, meeting Tony Romo, getting his autograph, and he is three feet away, and he cannot, he's just, he can't move, he can't talk, he, he just, like, talking, and he was, and so he just walked off, and he walked about 10 feet, and Riley goes, Daddy, it was Tony Romo, Tony Romo, he just, he just, I was like, I know, I'm the one that told you. There, there's something about it. For me, it would be just like that if Jesus turned and said, yeah, I'll come. Uh, uh, but look what happens. Instead of that, the man replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you to come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me, I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And look at verse 10. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished. Now listen, <laughs> you, you really got to do something. For those words right there, to be followed for the word astonish. Jesus was astonished. He was he could not believe what he was seeing. He was overwhelmed by something. Now, you got to be doing something pretty incredible if you're going to get something over old Jesus. There's going to have to be something very unique and something very uh, bold and something very new that if Jesus is going to look at you and it says. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished, and he said to those following him, i tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. 
I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subject of this kingdom will be thrown aside into darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 13, Jesus looked at the man and said, Go, it will be done just as you believed it would. And, this, and his servant was healed at that very hour. You see, when the foundation is right, it has to be accompanied with that faith that Jesus is who he says he is. And that's why you can sing the song that we're singing just a second ago, that he is my everything and that he's bigger than my pain. He's bigger than my shame. He's bigger than my sickness. He's bigger than my broken heart. Because in order for you and I to make sure that we make it into heaven, that we don't stand before Jesus one day and he say, man, I don't even know who you are. I don't know who you are. Yeah, but I, look at everything that I did. I was at church for 30 years straight. I only missed two Sundays. Look at everything. That I, 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 look at the money I gave. Look what I invested. They named a building after me. Look at everything that I've done. I donated. I volunteered. Jesus, yeah, but I don't know who you are. That's great. I'm glad that you, what you did brought people to, but I don't know who you are. All Jesus is saying is, listen, you got to obey the scripture. It has to be accompanied with that faith. I pray, God, give me that faith to truly believe that God can do what he says he can do. This man had the faith that, you know what? I have the power to tell people to do, to do something and they do it. If he is who he says he is, if he's the son of God, he don't have to be there. All he has to do is say the word and he can be healed. I believe he can do that. If I can do that here on earth and he is truly who he says he is and he's God, he just has to say the word. You see, that faith filters over into your daily life to where so many times we feel like I got to get to church and if I could just have this person pray for me, if I could just get here, then everything will be all right. No, that faith needs to kick in for you and I that, listen, God has the ability no matter where you're at, what you're doing, what the situation, I don't care if the bank account's negative, I don't care what's taking place, God has the ability if you'll just believe, if you will just have the faith to believe that he is who he says he is. You don't have to have him come to your house. You don't have to have some great divine intervention where the heavens open up and, oh, thus saith the Lord. You don't have to have all that. Everybody, I look for a sign. I need God to tell me. Now, get on your knees and shut your mouth for about 30 seconds. And he will tell you what you need to do. I didn't mean that as mean as it sounded. But you know what I'm talking about? Running around trying to find if the foundation is right. And the only way you get the foundation right is when you're obedient to God's word. Not obedient to mama, not obedient to, to your friends, and not obedient to a religion, but obedient to to the word of God that when you confess your sin and you accept him as your Lord and Savior that's where your foundation begins because it's built on a risen Savior it's not built on a dead God buried in some tomb somewhere where you can go and visit listen the word of God in Christianity is based on an empty tomb we can go to where he was buried but he's not there he's not there he has risen. He is alive. And he sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I, praying for you and I, pulling for you and I. That's our God. And the moment we accept a loving God, a living God that crucified, that was crucified for you and I, his blood was shed on Calvary for me and for you. We talked about it last Wednesday night. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know who anyone is? 
That's you and that's me. That's anyone. Anyone. And when we accept that, that is the foundation that we have to build our family on, our life on, our business on. Every relationship has to be built on the truth. It has to be built on the kingdom of God. Because if not, everything else will fail. You build it on your own talent. You build it on your own resources, your gifts, your experience. Not going to matter. Because when life comes at you, and it will come. That's what Jesus was saying here. He didn't say, build your house on the rock and nothing will ever happen to you. Accept me as your Lord and Savior. And from this moment on, you will live a guilt-free, trouble-free life. Oh, everything that he does prepares you for what's about to happen. It's given us that secret weapon. It's given us that extra ump just to hang on and to believe. It's given us what? It, it's given us hope. Hope. It gives us something. It gives us hope that this is not it. That it doesn't end here on this earth. That this is not the best that it's going to be. It gives us a hope that one day we'll spend eternity in heaven. I read several years ago about an experiment they did in a little lab, and they were using just little lab mice that they do for all kinds of stuff. And they were taking these mice, and they were throwing them in water, and they were timing how long they would swim. And so they, they did this experiment, and then the next time they did it, they would drop them in there for a little bit of time, and then they would pull them out. And then they would put them back in and pull them out. And they, they come to the conclusion that when they would do that, these mice would swim longer and longer and longer. You know why? Because there was a hope that they were going to be taken out. Because they experienced they were struggling and all of a sudden they were taken out. And the next time they got put in, it was in their mind there was a hope that if I can just hang on a little bit longer, they're going to take me out. You see, as a believer, as a Christian, we have that blessed hope that one day Christ is coming back for his church. That he's coming back for me and he's coming back for you. We have that blessed hope that this is not it. And when we build our foundation on the truth of the gospel, that it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that has the power to save, it's the power of salvation. For everyone who believes. It's that faith that he is who he says he is. That this isn't a collection of fairy tales. There are people today in pop culture and writing books and popular that want to convince you today that this is just a collection of a bunch of stories that have been passed down for years and there's no power, there's no truth in any of it. That's a lie. This is God's word it has the ability to change everything in your life. There's nothing you can say to me tonight that convince me otherwise. When you get the foundation right, you can build whatever you want to on it. It doesn't matter.